Welcome to the second part in the series Ethereum for Investors. In this video, we'll talk about the notion of value, about investment, about Ethereum as a platform and Ether as a currency, as well as the different opportunities and risks in the Ethereum space. That is the currency as well as the platform and also the ecosystem around it, that is all the projects and startups that are being built around or on top of Ethereum. So let's begin. Just a quick overview, let's have a look at the timeline. So beginning 2014, uh, the founder of Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin, uh, published the Ethereum white paper where he gave a pretty good overlook of the different concepts, what was before Bitcoin, state, transi uh, state transition systems, blockchain technology, and he introduced re really the foundations for Ethereum. Uh, then just a little while later, Gavin Wood formalized the basically the Ethereum platform uh, in his yellow paper, which is a very academic and formal work. It's very interesting. It's probably not very accessible for most people, but you can, it's one of the best way to really understand the Ethereum virtual machine and all those concepts that probably you don't need to know about, but that are very interested for someone who's that are very interesting for someone who's interested in understanding exactly how the platform works. Then uh, a very important event in August of 2014, uh, the Ethereum Foundation, which is a non-profit, sold 60 million Ether for about $80 million. Uh, that money uh, has been used since then for developing the platform and paying developers. Then uh, also an important event in November of 2014, DEFCON zero. zero. It's the first one, but it started with zero. Um, was the DEFCON, so DEFCON zero was basically the developer conference uh, around the Ethereum platform. So they talked about the further development of the Ethereum platform, but also there were different projects and companies that were being built at the time that came and talked and presented their projects. So it was already a very exciting time. And much, re much more recently, uh, in August of 2015, uh, they released the Frontier version of the Ethereum platform. Uh, it was command line only and so it wasn't really let's say available to the general public but anyone who could use command line and have Linux and th there's been also a Windows and Mac version anyone who could use a command line uh, could use them uh, then a very important event as well in September of 2015, uh, Augur uh, has done its crowd sale and $5 million have been raised. Uh, that, that was uh, quite an important event because uh, that's, that's one of the biggest crowd sale as well of Ethereum, which is extremely big for a project as well. Um, but for Augur, it was, it was quite also quite impressive because I thought the marketing was extremely well done. The communication was good. The, the business model was also very clear. So they kind of set a precedent in how to build um, a blockchain or Ethereum project and startup and how to make it profitable in some sense. Although Augur is also a non-profit, um, we can talk about more about its business model later, but it, it was an important event in the Ethereum space for sure. Then uh, in October of 2015, they released the Ethereum wallet in its alpha version. So you could 
you don't you didn't need to use the command line to transfer funds and, and you could do it in a more intuitive way although it's still not extremely accessible um, it's it's becoming much more user friendly and in November of 2015 in London Defcon 1 so the second developer conference uh, happened and it was extremely interesting I, I, I really wish I could have been there and it was one week of presentations from the morning till late afternoon and there were projects after projects and startups and, and ideas and and it was extremely it was really fascinating. I really loved I, I almost I almost could follow everything that was there and uh I've I've been it really got me even more excited about Ethereum in general. And uh also about at the same time, although it might not be quite accurate, but they, they did the first uh, Mist Alpha release, which is basically the browser or the navigator that you need for browsing um, dApps, decentralized apps, which we talked about in the previous video. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then maybe you should watch the previous video and I'll just post a uh, um, link to it on top of the screen all right and in december uh, of 2015 homestead which is the version of ethereum after the fr after frontier has been announced uh, when it will be developed is not quite sure yet um, as you watch this video it might have already happened all right, so just to have a quick look at what we've looked at uh, in the previous video, we talked about Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin as a currency, um, what what it how it works, uh, how the mining system and proof of work system works. Talked a little bit of, about the incentives for miners to make the network more secure. We also talked about issues with ASICs, miners, and centralization, mining pools, the, the problem with the block size and scalability, and as well as the, the issue in that, that is becoming more prevalent in electricity waste, as well as the different image issues, and also the state of regulations, although I didn't go too much into this because uh, I'm not an expert, but something that uh, was interesting to, to learn about. And that was a segue into learning about Ethereum, which was really the main focus of the last video. Um, so we talked about the different technological, technological improvements over Bitcoin, not just the uh, faster uh, block time, but also a lot of different design decisions that, that have been made and, and also improvement in the crypto uh, in the cryptography and the primitives behind it. And really the point was to talk about smart contracts and dApps, which we did in a very general and abstract way. And in this video now, I will give you examples. I'll talk about projects and about companies that are either uh, getting crowdfunded soon or that are looking for developers or that are being new ideas and new concepts and that uh, will take a, a fair amount of time to talk about them as well. We also talk about proof of stake a little bit. I'll try to to go a bit more, deep, a bit more deeply into proof of stake because it's actually quite relevant in the discussion about ether as a currency and also potentially as and also relevant for ethereum as a platform because it could enable um, features that might not be so easy to do or not quite efficient using proof of work as it is now and we also talk a little bit about scalability um, although it's a topic that is 
really complex and not there's not much about it that you can find and i thought it's something that we might leave for later also when we have more information about it cool so as this is a, a series for investors as although anyone who's interested in ethereum and cryptocurrencies and and managing trust and 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 finance and basically anything that could be around ethereum we'll need to know um we need to think about value and warren buffett tells us price is what you pay and value is what you get and i think it's very important to always keep this in mind so in this presentation there will always be at least in the back of our heads thoughts and ideas about value and risk ideally we want to maximize value and minimize risk and that means how much risk are we willing to take how to deal with variance how to diversify your portfolio so that you reduce variance and have either a more steady income or just a more just or steadier um, let's say value in your portfolio and also in a more general fashion how to make rational decisions so i'm not really going to talk about these things but i think it's important that every time you make a, uh, an investing or investment decision you kind of need to have those can those questions answered Am I being rational? What are my biases? Uh, is this making my portfolio more diverse or am I putting all my eggs in the same basket? Uh, how will I deal with variance if from one day to the next the value of my portfolio drops by 10%, will I be affected? Uh, will I sell when it's going down, although I might maybe buy or you know all the things are important to consider although that's not the the purpose of this video so we have time and money some have more time some have more money some have both and we basically have four options the first is speculation in regarding ethereum and and the ethereum space and cryptography uh, and cryptograph in cryptocurrencies in general so we can we can speculate on currencies and very soon we'll be able to speculate on on prediction markets which i will go more into and i think is a very exciting uh development um so that's one way to spend your time and money another i know another way which is the main focus of this video is investment investing your money uh Either in being a proof of stake validator, I will talk about it later. See if it's something that might be interesting to you. That that, and and also more generally, I think it's what most people are looking for: blockchain venture capital. That is, crowd sales or way to actually get shares in blockchain or Ethereum-based companies and projects, and how to profit from the growth that will certainly happen in that space and also how to accelerate it by contributing your money if you cannot contribute your time uh, on the other side there's also the possibility of developing which is something that is always welcome if you're a developer you have some skills your lawyer or your designer or you have some skills that could be used uh, that could be useful for in, in the ether space then and if, if you want to, then you should definitely uh, look at some of the projects. I suggest you look at the videos uh, from DEFCON 1 and see if there is one project that you'll be interested in and want to contribute to. And also another aspect is education. Uh, it's something that, I've, that, I've, that I'm kind of already doing with those videos, but I thought about doing it in a more rigorous and in a different format and that's something that could be done for other theories as well as development. So maybe talking about smart contracts. So if you're interested in this, you can just leave me a comment and tell me what you would like to see in the future. Cool. 
So let us talk about Ether as a currency. It's quite important that we distinguish Ethereum, which is the platform, from Ether, which is the currency. So Ether, the currency. It can be written in different ways. So that is kind of a E uh, and I've seen it written in all those ways. Uh, if you just say ether, ethers uh, with capital E or not, you'll be understood. But it's, it's not Ethereum. Ethereum is the platform, ether is the currency. As of today, out of, as of December of 2015, uh, proof of work is the underlying mechanism securing the Ethereum platform. There is a block reward of five Ether, so ETH, Ether per block. So that means that a miner, when he mines a block, he will get rewarded he will earn five ether. The block time is about 17 seconds. And using that information, you can actually figure out how much ether are being created on a daily or yearly basis. Um, in, in Ethereum, the, the block reward is, con is constant. That means that it won't change. But when switching to proof of stake, this will change. This is different to Bitcoin where the block reward is actually halved every uh, so years. And there's also an interesting concept of uncles, which I won't go into, but uh, that's something that's also making the, the, the network more secure, but it's also something that you need to consider uh, when you, you think about supply and inflation. So the market cap as of today, is uh, $71 million um, and the supply of, of Ether is a bit more than uh, $75 million. Uh, the range of the market cap in US dollars is between uh, $45 and $85 million. Uh, in, if you take all the different um, exchanges, that is platforms where you can exchange Ether for Lite, Litecoin, for Dogecoin, for Bitcoin, for fiat currency like euros, dollars and anything else. The volume is on average um, maybe 200, uh, 250,000 and maybe 300,000 300, uh, 300, or maybe something like this. On average, but the, it's within the it's in the range, it's within that range usually. Um, the main exchanges that is places where you can buy ether, either uh, if you have some other cryptocurrency, exchange it for your cryptocurrency, get and get ether, or if you have fiat money like dollars and euros, then you can go to Kraken, for example. That's what I use. Uh, I think that's a pretty nice platform. It's also quite important that you have trust in that platform because that is those platforms are centralized. That is, you really have to trust them in order to get that money. Just like you would trust a bank, but you trust your bank, I hope. So uh, to get those statistics, uh, you can go to those different pages um, if you want. All those links that I will give during this video, uh, you can either find them if you're on YouTube on the in the description box, and I'll also write an article where all of this will be where you can actually get the slides. Um, so for the general statistics, which is quite interesting, uh, etherchain.org, and if you want to follow uh, the prices, then you can go there. Cool. Um, the idea of ethers is to serve as fuel, in some sense, for smart contracts. So we talked about smart contracts. Smart contracts are, if you want, a set of rules that are 
ex being executed uh, autonomously on the Ethereum platform. So Ether um, serves as fuel for smart contracts and there is that notion of gas price, which is how much Ether you have to pay for each single computational step. So if you want to make an addition, you would pay that much. Of course, it's extremely, it would be a ridiculously low amount, but in the end, it actually sums up. So if you want to do something more complex, you'll have to pay more, obviously. Um, Ether is also a currency just like Bitcoin. Um, some of the Ethereum developers are paid in Ether. Uh, it's highly volatile. Um, I mean, there are more volatile assets, but it's definitely a volatile asset, just like any other cryptocurrency. And um, I would argue it's quite hype dependent, like any other cryptocurrency. And um, it, it seems that there are s quite a few irrational, without imposing a judgment on that, but irrational decisions that are being made by people who trade because you see really anomalies. But it's also because the, the volume is relatively low that the market's not always very efficient in the same that in the sense that the price um, might be higher or lower than what it should be considering the general opinion. But sometimes someone uh, sells and, and the price can drop by 10% and one hour later, it's it's just back at the same level of course in a very liquid market that wouldn't happen i expect the ether market to get more liquid uh, in the future um, but that's definitely something that's quite true when when defcon one uh, when well, when microsoft announced that they would be sponsoring defcon one in november of 2015, uh, there's been quite a steep increase um, in prices, which I think was pretty rational. But uh, you, but what was less rational is that just before this, uh, Nick Zabo posted a tweet uh, on Ethereum, and uh, and the prices just went up by at least 30 or 40 percent in just one or two days, and that that just came from people that probably didn't know about Ethereum and that actually own Bitcoin and they just pushed the price up. And um, so that's the kind of stuff that can happen and that's perf perfectly normal. Uh, but if you are invested in Ether, then you, you need to understand that uh, price is not necessarily uh, the best reflection of value, at least not the current price. Uh, and that's why it's important to always distinguish between price and value and that a news can can change the price dramatically and after a week it will just normalize usually um, so ethereum like uh, sorry ether are the only way to pay fees uh, in the platform as of now so if you want to execute a smart contract uh, if you want to basically do do a transaction or anything on the network, you will need to pay in Ether. In the future, uh, there is the idea uh, to abstract, uh, to do some kind of cryptocurrency abstraction where you wouldn't necessarily need to have Ether to pay transaction fees, uh, but basically any currency that miners or validators in the future might accept. So it's something that's quite interesting and, and rather positive, although um, it made me wonder whether it meant that Ether were less valuable. And I think that's a, a interesting conversation to have. Uh, but my, my conclusion is it's more that it's, it's quite important to make it widely accessible. And it's also what makes the Bitcoin adoption sometimes a bit tricky is that in order to do anything with Bitcoin, you need to have Bitcoins. And that's not really a bug, that's more of a feature, but in Ethereum, since its, its purpose is to be very general, you would actually want uh, to have the adoption to be extremely easy and, and ideally people would not even need to know about Ethereum in order to use it or to use some applications built on top of it. 
So I think that's quite an interesting development, but that's not for now, but that's something that's been uh, scheduled for Serenity in uh, EIP 101. Um, and then there is the switch to proof of stake. And that's where the ultimate use of Ether is, is in bounding stake. So maybe I'll just tell you a bit more about what proof of stake is. I'll, I'll just, in the next slides, I will actually explain it in more details, but just so that you know. So there is proof of work, which basically uh, is based off on mining and solving crypto challenges, uh, try, uh, challenges. And there is proof of stake in which validators put their money or their stake in Ether on the line to vouch for transactions. That's a simple way to put it. And I'll try to be more accurate in the next slides. So in the future, which is, so now uh, Ethereum is still based on proof of work, just like Bitcoin and most other cryptocurrencies. But in the future, there will be that switch to proof of stake. And that, that implementation is actually called Casper. So in proof of stake, you have validators instead of miners. In a sense, miners are also validators, but they have to do something more. They have to not only create a block, which will include all the transactions, and but to actually vouch for that block and say that those transactions are valid and, and, and that they need to be included in the blockchain, they have to solve very difficult mathematical crypto graphic challenges uh, that you could only solve if you put a lot of computing power into them. It's extremely unlikely that you would be that you could solve one uh, just by chance. It's, it's basically impossible. And using Bayes theorem, you can actually prove that if uh, a crypto challenge has been solved that, that has some difficulty, then you know that it took at least that much computing power on average. And it's, it's very accurate. And that's basically how in proof of work, you can know almost for certain that uh, there is consensus in the network because you assume that no single actor could have actually forged it. Uh, and in proof of stake, then you have validators and you don't have that concept of mining. You don't have that concept of solving crypto challenges and putting a lot of computational power into creating a block with some special crypto challenge. What you do instead is that a validator will bound stake. That is, he will own some ether, for example, and he will sign. He will first he will prove that he actually owns them, and then he will say. I am the owner of that amount of money. I guarantee with my money that the transaction that I put into this block that I give you are valid. And there is some way using cryptography and math to actually punish him if he creates invalid blocks or if he basically um, doesn't go with the general consensus. The, 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 the principle is that people should actually, validators should actually collaborate to create a consensus on what the actual block is, what transaction are valid, and uh, basically create that, that blockchain the same way than proof of work, but using collaboration instead of a competition. So it's very energy efficient. Uh, which of course proof of work isn't. It's actually quite the opposite. Uh, proof of work really relies on uh, on thermodynamic on the thermodynamic property that that every amount of work uh, has to be done um, has to involve some some physical 
movement and 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 um, an energy transition, which of course costs has a cost, and so that that's very inefficient. And we talked in the last video that it was actually more uh, it was similar to the energy consumption of of Ireland. Um, so proof of stake uh, is more about collaboration and less about competition. It also incentivizes validators to focus more on bandwidth instead of hash rate. It doesn't matter if you can solve billions of crypto challenges per second. Uh, what matters more is that you actually are very fast and can uh, basically communicate with everyone in the network because everyone's profit depends on the ability to collaborate in a, and reach consensus. also solves the nothing at stake problem because the um, problem with proof of work is that miners uh, don't necessarily have an incentive to collaborate and it's actually quite the, op the opposite uh, and, and, and the, the thing is that if you stop mining it doesn't matter but even worse is that that can be a, f that can be a feature that can be interesting but the, the real problem is that you, if you if you do something malicious on the network, you don't lose anything, because, I mean, there you don't have any stake in the in the system. While in proof of stake, if if you sign an invalid transaction, then then you can lose your stake. So, so th that really solves that that issue. The the difference with the implementation of Casper is that instead of being objective like proof of work where you can actually use a base theorem and principles in thermodynamics to know to give a mathematical proof that uh, it would have taken that much work and that it's extremely unlikely that someone could have forged it to actually know that the blockchain is secure in proof of stake you can do this once you know who to trust but you first need to get introduced to the system in some sense. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem because in a sense it's uh, the, the, the problem already exists with mining software and, and, and software in general because the, the Bitcoin miners or miners in general, they already trust the, the mining software in a sense. I mean, they could look at the source, it's true, but Besides that, I mean, they, they kind of have to trust it. And um, so, but proof of work is, is at least Casper version relies more on asking a friend just to, to get introduced to the network. Like anyone can connect, but then to actually know that the, basically the cryptographic information that's being provided to you is correct, you kind of need to, to know someone who you trust. But then you're fine. Um, potentially, it's much faster than, than proof of work, and uh, it could also be used for more than just transactions. Um, some application might actually need that, but I won't go too much into this. But I heard that some project actually changes change platform because they actually needed proof of stake. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Um, contrary to proof of work. Uh, there might be no block reward um, or it might be lower it, it, it will either be zero or something less than what it is now um, so just a recap uh, in the proof of work implementation of ethereum uh, the block reward is five ether per block and in proof of stake it probably will be zero and so you will ask how will validators actually be incentivized well, they will earn transaction fees proportionally to how much stake they have. And also if someone uh, creates invalid blocks or signs something that doesn't respect the consensus, then uh, some of their stake will be destroyed and that stake might be redistributed to, might be, uh, redistributed to the, the validators or something like this. Uh, that, Maybe or maybe not. We'll see if there is inflation. If there is, it will be much lower. Um, also, it has 
for so, for people who actually own Ether, whether they are validators or not, because you don't have to be a validator to use Ethereum at all. You don't even need to know what it, that it exists. It's just re. It's it's only the system that Ethereum will use to make the network secure instead of proof of work. Uh, you don't need to 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 do any of this, but it's it's something that's quite important because it's a it's a radical change uh, in the way consensus is achieved on a network. And the point is that since people have to bound their stake for some amount of time, possibly four months or something like this, uh, the actual supply of ether will actually go down, which should technically push prices up. And uh, so proof of stake has been already used in different cryptocurrencies. There are quite a few papers about it. Uh, but as, as for Casper, uh, it remains to be fully tested, implemented, uh, tried in different environments and scrutinized academically. But I'm pretty positive that um, it's something that can, that can work. Uh, I think it's it's a it's a it's a tricky design decision, but I think it's the right one, and it will enable many things. And uh, the the only thing that 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 is a little bit that we lose is is uh, objectivity, and so it becomes weakly subjective, which is just a way to say that it's not as strongly objective as proof of work was. But besides that, there are a lot of other advantages and every, in, in, in engineering, it's all about design decisions. You cannot have all of it. Um, but I think it's a very nice uh, proposal and a very nice system and, and a solution to actually solve the consensus uh, questions. All right. So a very good resource that you can find uh, on proof of stake is the link I gave you here. It's very good. There are a lot of also almost, let's say, um, like specifications that the public probably doesn't know about. So if you want to do some technical reading, you can read that. So the question is like, if you are an investor, well, why do you care about this? Well. If you actually own N of Ether, Ether, then you could become a validator. So what does that imply? You need to own at least 1,500 uh, 1, Ether. Well, that's from the specification uh, from doc some document I found on the internet that was uh, written by uh, Vlad Zamfir and, and uh, Vitalik Buterin. Uh, it might be more. You need a very good internet connection. Um, and or at least a good one. I mean, in the I guess in the in the first one or two years, uh, you just need a good internet connection. You won't necessarily need to have fiber optic or something like this. If you do, then it's fine. And you need a and I think that's quite an important point that is that you need a twenty four seven connected uh, computer or server. Uh, typically, a Raspberry Pi would do it. It would be very cost effective. But I'm not sure that it will be powerful enough in the future. So uh, that's that's a question mark. Um, so the barrier for entry might be actually higher, if not much higher in practice. Maybe not much higher, but definitely higher. Um, so that might not be suited for everybody. But I think it will be suited for some people and um i might i might become one uh if if i think that the 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 model is right in the sense that uh yeah if, if it's profitable and uh, i think and and doable i would i would probably do it so the revenue to expect for uh, proof of stake validators or come, as I told you, from transaction fees and possibly from a block, a block reward. So um, the idea is that they are proportional and um, that means also that uh, it won't make any sense to to become a validator uh, if you don't, to become a validator if you don't have at least that much 
ether because the basically the you have initial costs and then uh, the then the cost becomes marginal after after some point and since the the revenues are proportional uh, there's definitely a, a difference but it's probably less extreme than than it is in proof of work where specialized hardware uh, like like ASIC miners especially in Bitcoin uh, make it very even more dramatic that people who don't have specialized hardware cannot profit at all from the network cool so that's already uh, one uh, important aspect that we've discussed so just if you want to go back so we, we talked about proof of work which is a different way to achieve consensus on the network which is obviously needed in a distributed network that is trustless that is where you don't necessarily know other people or at least you you try to minimize the amount of trust that you need uh, in the system to actually use it. So let us talk about Ethereum as a platform, and that will be a segue into talking about the different projects and startups that are on top of it. So there are different implementations of the client that is typically the yeah, if, if you want, that's the program that actually that you run if you want to become a full node. That is, if you want to validate every transaction, execute every contract on the network and see that they are valid. Of course, you don't need to do this uh, on your smartphone. Like You can have a, an app that just is a light client that would just verify just what you need and nothing more. Uh, so there are two implementations and the, the advantage of, the, of having this is that although uh, it takes more time and, and more it costs a bit more to have developers working on different platforms uh, it gives choice to users but more importantly it actually helps underpin and, and, and look for uh, consensus disagreement between in, in the between the implementations that is there is a protocol which uh, stipulates how the how nodes and and how the protocol should work how the platform should work but there's always a difference between the, the theory and the application and having two uh, clients actually helps discover those uh, gray zones in the protocol description and that's quite important especially if you want to build smart contracts yourself. There are two programming languages for smart contracts on Ethereum. Uh, there is Solidity, which is quite similar to JavaScript and Serpent, which is extremely similar to Python. So as I told you before, uh, the actual release, at least as, as of December 2015, is Frontier. Um, it's kind of the wide west that's that's not the actual name but uh they, they they always use that let's say visual visual identity of the wild west if you, if you look at the ethereum.org website uh where it's basically in the desert and 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 it's kind of what they wanted to project and say you know like the network is not quite secure yet uh although i mean it's quite secure already, but they, they want to do a lot of testing and, and before they can actually release it to a wider audience. And the idea is to actually switch to Homestead, which might already have happened by the time you watch this video, and make it a bit more user-friendly and a bit more accessible. And then there should be Metropolis, although the name don't really matter. And that's where Mist, Adaptor, and different applications should actually uh, be at least in beta version or maybe even really released to the public and um, it should be much more user friendly and then there will be the big switch to the big transition to serenity where proof of stake and scalability should be implemented so that is a very 
big technological jump, I'd say. And so that's basically how it should go. We'll see in practice. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, proof of stake and serenity uh, might be released uh, at the end of 2016. Um, I don't quite know. I think that there are. Yeah, I think it, you need you need to see what what the Ethereum developers say. Um, I think scalability and proof of stake are are very difficult things. Although they have amazing benefits, but technologically it's quite difficult to do. Uh, so um, we'll see if it can be done uh, by 2016. Hopefully, it will. Uh, also, something that I have been asked about uh, is, is what are the competitors of or alternatives or threats to Ethereum. And um, so there are quite a few more, really, but there are two. The only two that come to mind, really. Uh, the first one is Counterparty, Counterparty, uh, which is uh, they've been around. Uh, they are quite they are quite active. Uh, it's also uh, a blockchain fork, uh, blockchain side. Uh, I'm sorry, a Bitcoin side chain, and um, uh, yeah, what they do is, is is interesting. They also try to provide smart contracts. Uh, personally, I don't think that. Uh, these projects will be very successful. Um, what is more interesting is actually Rootstock, uh, which uses a combined approach. So Rootstock is a Bitcoin sidechain as well. Uh, the idea is that you have the, the Bitcoin blockchain and the Rootstock blockchain and that uh, what happens on the Rootstock blockchain gets, if you want, validated through or on the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain. Although what I said is not quite accurate, um, just think of it as basically quite a centralized network that would translate that would actually process transactions and, and smart contracts, which would actually be run by Rootstock. So it's not quite decentralized and that would be the, the, the basic case, the default case. And then if uh, miners from Bi from Bitcoin actually agree to mine uh, Rootstock or basically roots, that's how they call them. If they are if they agree to, to mine and, and validate Rootstock contracts, smart contracts are being executed and, and include them in uh, the Bitcoin blocks, then uh, the, that might become uh, a bit more secure and more decentralized. Uh, I'm not quite sure about the incentive structure. Uh, I, I read the white paper that they released on December the 4th, uh, 2015. And um, Although I thought that the structure and the writing was was pretty well put, um, I didn't see anything specific. I didn't see any code, any implementation. Basically, they are trying to they are keeping everything secret until they release it. Uh, they say uh, around February two thousand sixteen. Um, you know, in the end, I don't think that it's gonna be more secure than than Ethereum because that's basically their argument. Uh, the argument is that uh, it will be as secure as the Bitcoin blockchain. I, I really doubt that it will. That it will, and also that it will bring to add value to the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem, while Ethereum doesn't. Because for all the, the rest of the of the things they say uh, are either dubious or there's stuff that you could also do in in Ethereum anyway. So um, the question is. Because to actually make their system secure, they need a two-way peg, and so they need a counterparty. And, and I think it's it's so it's really difficult. Uh, I think it's like doing something like Ethereum is already extremely technologically complex and requires advanced skills and 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 so much technology and knowledge. 
like doing something Turing complete uh, as a side chain of, of Bitcoin is, I think it, it just makes it so, so complex. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because, you know, like the problem with Bitcoin is that there are a lot of stuff that need to be backward uh, compatible. So you cannot just change the Bitcoin protocol to accommodate for rootstock or you cannot just uh, tell miners, well, yeah, please mine uh, our our roots or something like this. Because, yeah, they might have an incentive to, but they don't necessarily want to change the software and they don't... They, and, and the, the thing is that in order to make it, uh, to incentivize miners to do it, the, the, the transaction fees need to be high enough. And that, that either means that uh, contracts will have to pay higher fees or that there will be some, they will need to have some kind of, of currency that's really valuable, but I don't see why it would be so valuable uh, and if it is, then it's it's also kind of a an altcoin. So um, yeah, I mean, I would be glad if someone from Rootstock would were to explain to me why it's so superior to Ethereum. Uh, I'm personally very open-minded, but I don't think that it's 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 really so interest so interesting in. All, I'm not sure it brings the technology uh, forward. Although uh, I think that what they are trying to do as a project and um, in focusing on South America is really great. I think that's really amazing. And they are, I think that will, they will really open a market in South America if they succeed. And I wish they will and uh, try to make smart contracts uh, available to the to third world countries. Like they will focus on South America, but I can definitely see in the future that we could do the same in Africa and, and in Asia and basically all around the, the world. So I'm, I'm actually quite excited about what they will do in practice. Although I think that, although I'm not quite convinced about the technology and and, and all the, the different backwards compatible constraints that they have, because they, they, they you know, like that's so Ethereum could also have been built uh, as a Bitcoin sidechain, that was that was a question. The reason why they chose not to is not just to have a new currency. You know, it's it's not to make it's not to compete with Bitcoin. It's it's really not the point. I mean, Bitcoin is 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 fine. It it's doing its thing and 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 it has some uses at which it's very good for, basically storing value, or at least. Although it has quite a few issues, it's been very good at that purpose for for the last years. Uh, maybe now it's quite tricky, but but still, you know, and Ethereum has a different purpose. Different purposes imply different design decisions, and by trying to make something that wasn't built for smart contracts, really, or like general smart contracts like include them and, and it's, it's just not very realistic in my in my in my point of view but that's definitely an interesting project which uh just as a side note and then i'll, I'll go to the next one was quite uh funny to see that the 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 market um might be just a coincidence but the price of ether actually uh dropped quite significantly before they released the white paper so around the first of December and so until the fourth where they released it and then the price actually <laughs> recovered so maybe people were unimpressed by that white paper but that might be just a coincidence um, also uh, th those are the links for the different Ethereum releases and uh, here you can see the different uh, cryptographic and algorithms uh, that underlie and underpin uh, that basically underpin Ethereum. So yeah, uh, that, that is just, just as a side note, uh, crypto abstraction, basically the idea that you could use uh, the cryptography that you want uh, on the network. That would be for Serenity probably. And uh, so that it would be quantum safe, but let's not go into this, that's already quite technical. So, 
as there is a recap of lifetime, the potential application of Ethereum uh, are financial on, on, on one hand, so creating exchanges, decentralized exchanges, uh, bonds, financial bonds, insurance, although it cannot be purely on-chain, it, it has also to have a, an off-chain component, definitely something that could be done. Um, distributed stock is something that is definitely conceivable. conceivable. It's actually quite easy to do. Uh, if you create a company, you just you can just issue a token on Ethereum that will be your own token and you can control supply or create it in such a way that has limited supply or whatever the rules are and you could just distribute it in exchange for something else and basically that would be ownership or shares of your company. It's very simple, very easy, automatic, automatically uh, built uh, in Ethereum. So that there are actually a pro quite a few projects that do something like this. I will talk about them in just a few minutes. Then escrow is crowdfunding and escrow and crowdfunding as like I told you. Then uh, also smart property, which is very interesting. Uh, that's we'll talk about it in, in very soon. Decentralized markets for goods and services. Uh, what's being built on, on top of Bitcoin now is Open Bazaar, um, but it kind of has the same issues as uh, as Rootstock and all those Bitcoin sidechains that um, it will generate quite a bit of data and and as and since micro payments are getting really expensive to do in bitcoin uh, it's not clear whether those things can really work as side chains on bitcoin so definitely some but on ethereum that would be extremely that would be much easier to do and that would just work like this and it's been it's been thought about Prediction markets and reputation systems. So of course we think about Augur. I'll talk about them in a second. Domain names, probably fair gambling and decentralized autonomous organization, as well as IoT, Internet of Things, devices, inter, uh, interoperable, <laughs> as well as um, having a way to make IoT devices interact. So that's also quite interesting. All right, so what are the threats and weaknesses of Ethereum before we go into anything else? So competition, I talked about um, counterparty and, and stuff. Um, not very worried about them, but it's interesting to see what's being done. Regulations are definitely something that needs to be considered. Uh, typically uh, after proof of stake, it's I mean, already in some countries like Australia, uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general are not considered as a currency. And um, so switching to proof of stake uh, might definitely not help in regulations. At least it, it will, I mean, it will probably be regulated in, in a fair way, but uh, that might also mean that uh, you might at least have to pay uh, taxes on income that you get from uh, proof of stake validation, although it might take 10 years. <laughs> so to actually be implemented uh, in the actual juris uh, jurisdiction. So also something like if you have something complex and distributed, there's always the question of potential bugs and vulnerabilities. And uh, also the question of government uh, governance uh, like there is in Bitcoin, Bitcoin that is a huge issue. I think the, the issue is less in, in Ethereum because in a sense it's actually more centralized um, and there is a clear purpose and mission statement behind Ethereum whereas for Bitcoin, well, it's basically the work of Satoshi Nakamoto which today we don't know who, who it is so uh, it's very difficult for the Bitcoin community to agree on anything and in Ethereum it's less of a problem but there's definitely the, the question of who makes decision if there is disagreement and that kind of stuff. 
So the question of volatility just with any other cryptocurrencies, um, if you hold Ether, they might gain 10%, lose 10%, gain 20, lose five, and, and that's that should be expected and that's normal. And in the future, uh, there are many, many um, projects that are actually trying to create a stable coin. And I won't talk too much about it, but Maker DAO uh, is actually working on the the DAI uh, D A I uh, coin or DAI currency, which would be stable and backed by assets and something that's really quite inter interesting. So that might uh, make it possible for people to actually have stable value being stored uh, in the network using those systems. Of course, uh, one of the problems might be development delays. When you do something complex, uh, it's something to be expected. Um, so just like with any project, but it's something that you need to take into account if you are to invest or if you have some some typical, uh, if you have some deadlines or some, some goals that are time dependent. And also a tricky point is the founding of the core developers. Um, people who do private uh, projects can get funding uh, by giving shares or doing a, a crowd sale. Uh, the question is how will the core developers of the Ethereum platform be founded in the future? All right, so that's already quite uh, a deep jump into the platform. I think we've already looked at a lot of concepts and uh, I hope you're not overwhelmed, but now is really the fun part. So prediction markets. So among the projects and startups, I, w I have to start with prediction markets and especially with Augur. So Augur is a non-profit organization uh, that I think is is very interesting in, in, in many ways. So maybe first, what is a prediction market? Um, a prediction market is a market just like a financial market where you could trade currencies or good or services or anything else. But in that case, you kind of trade predictions. So there might be a question of the type, who will win the presidential election or what will the weather be or who will win that that uh, football game or whatever. And you basically can buy shares of yes or no, for example, for bina binary choices. So the, the question could be, uh, will Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton win the presidential election and you might, if you think that the price for the yes share is, 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 is right, then, then and you think she, it's more likely that she wins that, than the market actually thinks, then you would buy yes share and if you think it's the opposite, you would buy no share. You would buy shares for no, um, which might have different prices and you will basically uh, after, after some time, once the market, after the event actually happened, then reporters have to report on the event and uh, they will say whether she won or not after it happened. Of course, you could say, oh yeah, but what if they are malicious? And, and we'll just talk about it in a, in a second. But let's assume they actually give the right answer, then you will be, you will um, earn proportionally to how much you put and proportionally to how much it costs you, uh, how much each share costs you. Uh, if you're right and if you're wrong, well, you will have lost your money, just like in any betting scheme, of course. 
Um, also, what's quite interesting with Augur is that uh, they are a non-profit and they've been working or at least trying to introduce the idea to validators and uh, to regulators and um, and they are quite light in their way about going about doing this. I think that it's, it's very nice. In the future, they might switch uh, to uh, for profit. I think that's kind of the goal. But uh, since regulators uh, might not be so happy about it and might not understand all of the technicalities and all the implications, they're already taking it slow. But for you as a Nauger user, it doesn't change anything because you'll be able to create markets, basically ask questions and earn a percentage of the, the, of, of the market, typically from zero to two percent. And uh, if you have an opinion, you want to bet uh, on some issue, then you can, you can do it uh, using the Ethereum platform and Augur and uh, you'll be rewarded or not. And there's, the, there's a third category which uh, are the, the reporters. So that's why we need a reputation system. So it implements, so Augur implements a reputation token. Um, I won't go too much into this because that can take hours, uh, but it's really quite fascinating. And the idea is that it will uh, make it extremely difficult for people to collude and that the truth will prevail if you want and uh, so that you can be sure that the events will be reported on correctly that is if you predicted an event correctly and it actually so and in, so you predict an event and it actually happened then you will get rewarded and and so forth there was a crowd sale as i told you before the marketing was truly excellent i think it's really uh, uh kind of a model uh, that should inspire other startups and projects uh, in the blockchain, blockchain and Ethereum space, uh, because what they did was was really amazing. The the videos, the the the, the help, the the support, the community, the presentation, everything they do is very is very smart. It's clear and it's it's very accessible, which is something that you cannot say at least for accessibility. Everything that's being done on, on Ethereum is very smart, but it's not always very accessible to outsiders, uh, contrary to what Augur did. So a lot of stuff to learn from them. And uh, the, the business model um, is that market makers and reporters earn fees and uh, that basically reporters also, they, they own that reputation token and they also uh, can sell it uh, on on the market. So that is, if the networks become more uh, more used, then reputation token will actually acquire more value. And uh, if they do, they kind of get rewarded that way. Um, and of course, the more reputation token you have, the more uh, revenues you earn, since it's proportional from the markets you actually bought on. So so it's kind of proof of stake where you you have some kind of of asset if you want that act, that will actually give you revenue so it's quite an interesting business model um and that's uh, an infographic of how it works event occurs has come reported there's a basically a reporting phase then until they reach consensus it's being paid distributed if someone lies, he will actually be punished and it just goes over again. Uh, I mean, if you're more interested in Augur, if, you, if you're interested in Augur, uh, check their website. It's really, it's really good. You'll learn a lot about it. That's just a screenshot of the page of uh, the um, crowd sale at the time. Uh, so more than $5 million US dollars raised and I thought it was pretty amazing. Uh, another prediction market is Group Gnosis. Uh, it's being built by, it's being developed by Martin Koppelman from Consensus. Consensus is a great company working in the blockchain and Ethereum space, and they are doing a lot of exciting projects. 
Uh, I've actually bet on group gnosis um, for the Federal Reserve interest rates and I made a five ether on that, so I was quite happy. <laughs> but I don't think it's 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 not such an ambitious project as Augur, but it's one that already works and, and you can just do stuff. You can you can bet uh, on based on finance, politics. There are a few su subjects it's still very early uh, as of today. Uh, but it's still it's it works. It doesn't rely on reputation, but on reporters, and uh, so that's that's definitely something that could be improved on upon. But Augur is really trying to find uh, a solution to this with their reputation token. So Augur is definitely more exciting, but Group Gnosis has done a lot of stuff right, and it's also it's also fun to use. All right. So smart property, talked about that. One project that I really want to talk about, especially now if you if you watch it in December or maybe January 2016 or February or hopefully as you watch it, uh, they, it's not over yet because they are actually going to do a, a crowd sale, which I think is pretty exciting. We'll also talk about Airlock, although uh, just very briefly because it's not very clear what they are doing. Uh, a very exciting project as well, it's also Digix. I think it's, it's very well built and, and one that's uh, also quite interesting and in, uh, which shows a, a different philosophy about uh, managing uh, copyrights uh, or basically uh, ownership rights regarding intellectual properties, especially music. So it's quite interesting. So let's talk about Slockit. So Slock is a portmanteau word. So basically a made up word, uh, which stands for smart, safe and secure lock. So maybe you've already heard about smart locks. So smart locks in themselves don't really have to do anything to do with the blockchain. They are just locks that you could lock and unlock at a distance, basically using uh, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or some kind of wireless technology. They already exist. What Slockit is trying to do is um, to make managing your property typically your bike, your car, potentially your apartment, or different object, objects that you have decentralized, have that management decentralized. Uh, they have a slogan that I, that I quite like, if you can lock it, you can slock it. So if you can put a smart lock on it, then you can use slock it to manage access to the object that you're locking. And, and basically they, um, it's, it's, it works on using escrows, an escrow on the Ethereum platform. So I'll give you a very simple example. Um, I, want to rent my, I want to rent my apartment to you uh, for two days. I have a smart lock on my door. Uh, on Monday, I leave my apartment Monday evening, you come to my apartment. Uh, I, you, you. In in the meantime, you actually paid. So I give you some kind of uh, through slock slock it. I will make, give you some kind of access right to my apartment. So you can just enter the building maybe, uh, and then you could unlock my 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 door and because you will be the actual uh, you'll be allowed to during that period and you would have paid an, uh, an escrow for that and then you can just enter and use my apartment and um, and after two days you lose the apartment uh, the contract will actually uh, stop giving you access to this and I can just go back to my apartment and if everything 
went as expected. Uh, I get I get paid for the rent, and uh, and you just can go home without issue. If there is an issue, then uh, it can be done in different ways, and there will be uh, th there is an escrow, which means that you have to pay some kind of of caution or some kind of uh, yeah some kind of escrow, and um, very simply if it's very problematic we can just go to a judge but since the contract is extremely clear it's very simple and in 99.5 percent of cases we won't even need a judge because everything is automated so there's no yeah can i stay one more day or something like this like oh if i if i'm if i agree to this i could just say okay sure but then please uh pay that amount and then i'll give you access to it and if i can't i say no, sorry, I can't, and I will just stop giving you access to it, and then you cannot use that property anymore. And it's very simple. It also makes, um, it, it could potentially make Airbnb much more trustless, and uh, trustless in the sense you would require much less trust, and it would, it would make it more efficient, more automated, and you could use it in many different ways. Typically also uh, bikes, uh, that are being rented by the state in some cities, uh, that would definitely be an option. Uh, maybe something that's not very popular in in, in the US, but uh, in Europe, uh, it's something that's, that's, that actually is done in some cities where you can actually rent a bike directly on the street and you have to pay with your credit card, for example, and then you can rent it for some amount of time. It could definitely use Slockit and the blockchain to manage that that um, that system and, and that the management of locks. And especially if it's your bike, if it's the state, then it's already centralized, so it doesn't really matter. You don't necessarily need something that is that's, that's decentralized. But if it's everyone's lending or renting his bike, like, then everyone is renting his bag, then it's a completely different story and that's why uh, it's quite interesting to have something like this. Uh, I'm quite excited about the fact that they will have a pre-sale um, at the beginning of 2016, uh, as they said, and you can only buy uh, Slack tokens in Ether or using other cryptocurrencies, but I believe that uh, in the end it will be in Ether anyway, so that you could for example, pay in Bitcoin or in Litecoin, Dogecoin, or whatever. But I, I guess they have to be um, actually converted into Ether, so you have to pay higher fees. Uh, I, I I suppose from the from the web from the website it wasn't quite clear. Uh, so if you're interested in this, then um, uh, that's 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 something that's quite exciting. The the presale is you could ask yeah what what is that pre-sale for it's it's not about selling smart locks it's not about it's not about it's not about the product it's about uh, owning shares um in the dao which is basically in the company so that that's nice because that actually gives us the first concrete example of decentralized autonomous organization uh, on Ethereum that I, that we that we can talk about. So if you own some uh, Slack tokens, you'll be able to vote on important issues in the company, which instead of company we can say DAO now. And uh, you can use your your slugs or your locks without having to pay any fee. And um, you can also trade them just like reputation token from Augur on exchanges. And we'll talk about an exchange that will probably be able to trade those tokens in the future. Um, and if voted by the DAO, so if the majority of people uh, actually agree, uh, a portion of the profits generated by slugs, typically the, the, the sales that will be done uh, from the product that they will release, will proportionally uh, get redistributed to the owners of uh, Slack tokens owners. So, Slack tokens owner. So, 
that's I think that's quite interesting, and that's a very interesting way to think about governance, to think about ownership of companies, and to think about decision making processes. Uh, and I mean, as you probably know, in a company, you can buy different kind of stocks. You can buy stocks uh, that just give you some share of the company, share of its assets in a sense, and one that actually gives you a share uh, in the decision making processes. And and here you would have something that would have both, and um, it would be done on the blockchain in a decentralized fashion. I think it's, it's a very interesting experiment. Uh, I'm quite curious to see how it will go. Uh, I mean, you never know, but it's it's definitely a fun experiment. And they plan on releasing the Ethereum computer, which would be basically a Raspberry Pi device uh, that would be pre-configured and that you could actually use to manage your locks and it's also quite interesting because what they are doing will also uh, reinforce the use of Ether as a currency. First, like quite directly because of the crowd sale, because people will eventually have to buy Ether. So I expect that if the if the marketing is good and the the, and the crowd sale is successful, well, there will be quite a, a bit of money that will be injected into the system. Um, so that should push the, the Ether prices up, at least by a little bit. It's difficult to, to say anything anyway, because there could be so many factors that could go in different directions. But at least in the short term, that might happen. Then and, and in the longer term, in the medium term, that might not have an effect. And in the longer term, if what they do is really successful, um, having escrow in Ether, because that's exactly what they're going to do, Will really reinforce the the use of ether as a currency after iep uh, 101 uh, crypto abstraction will make it maybe possible to uh, pay for slugs or for locking or locking locks uh, using different currencies but until then uh, ether might become more interesting but that's just one possibility you know it's Slockit is just one project among many others, but I think it's one of the most exciting projects. Um, and and if you just look at the advisory boards or the, the, the founders, they are all uh, prominent members. Uh, two are from the Ethereum Foundation, at least, and, and very important members. And um, and I, th I think it's, it's a very interesting project, but, you know, I might be wrong. Um, but the, the idea is also that this will make it much more concrete to users what Ethereum is. Because if I tell you about a decentralized distributed system using cryptographic primitives to secure itself and manage smart contracts that are truly complete, I mean, already there, I, we. <laughs> It's already lost, and then and then I, I'll I'll have to tell you to install some some Ether wallet or Mist's wallet, Mist browser to actually use a DApp, and then you will understand what it is, and then you need to have Ether and have an account. It's for most people, it's too complex. So if we can actually bring this and in, into something that's more concrete, like a device, and make it much more user friendly then it's it's a huge win and it would actually be pre-installed and and it would already have ether in it that they, it's not in that sentence but they said it um probably not that much but um so i mean i assume that they they have to buy some ether as well or at least maybe they already have some but it's it's definitely uh quite interesting for ether as a currency Although some people in the community have always been saying, yeah, Ether is just uh, just fuel for smart contracts. Well, we see that Slockit and, and the different applications that actually manage ownership, among others, uh, might actually show that Ether could be used for more than just fuel for smart contracts. 
but that's just an opinion and we'll see what the future holds. And they are scheduling for a launch in 2017. Uh, find you'll find all the links here all the information I think it's really well put and copied some of what the text they have I won't read it all of uh, won't read all of it but I thought it was extremely well put so if you want to read my slides I will as I told you I will give you the links um, and uh, I think it's very well put uh, and uh, if they can do just half of if their marketing can be just half as good as Augur's, I think they'll be very successful. Because uh, as they say, it's it's a it's a huge market. You know, it's then the question is like, can they capture it? And and that would require a much thorougher that would require a very thorough analysis. But um, uh, I, I think at least in the crypto cryptocurrency community, that that will be interesting. And if they can make the Ethereum integration seamless then that might be quite successful but difficult to say and yeah um, you can read all of that so then there's Airlock which is kind of similar I assume uh, there is there are actually very little details on the website but it's also a project that might be quite interesting um, and um, I suppose it's quite similar and we'll see, but it's also good to see that there are other projects. Uh, that means that it's not a crazy idea to do it if there's competition and uh, and yeah, maybe, maybe it will bring about something good. You can find the website there. They seem to have a pretty good team. And now I can talk about Digix, uh, which is, um, also quite an interesting project. Uh, so it's about managing digital assets, especially gold, really. You know, it's, um, there are actually, I actually heard, um, you know, I, I, I've been going to some um, events and meetups on the subject and, and not, not about Digix, but about Ethereum and, and, and the crypto space and um and yeah digital assets management is something that is also quite interesting and i'm sure we'll see more of those companies in the future running on top of ethereum so digic is focused on digital digital gold ownership um it's privately founded so probably no crowd sale um i mean no crowd sell, selling uh, ownership of the company, but uh, they will actually do some kind of crowd sale where you can basically buy some gold. Um, the, the escrows are also in Ether. In Ether. Um, so it's one more use case where um, Ether as a currency or at least a store value might might increase a little bit but it remains to see whether that project is successful but that is to say that it's it's, uh, it's it's interesting to see and we'll see how it how it develops and the idea is to also be able to buy uh, gold <coughs> or buy ownership of some gold in some vaults in Singapore that they own basically uh, of course it's not you won't have any gold at your home the idea is that you you use the, the blockchain to get ownership of some gold that is stored in a secure vault in Singapore, where the leg leg uh, legislation are, are pretty favorable and uh, it's pretty secure. So it's quite interesting. You can find uh, more about that uh, on their website. Then there is a uh, Ujo Music, um, and I thought that project was really interesting because uh, of the philosophy be of the philosophy behind it. So it's it's about managing uh, rights for pieces of music. So if you take a typical uh, record label, then 
there are a lot of third parties that actually uh, take cuts and actually the 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 musicians don't make that much money out of it and also it's very opaque and and the idea here is to have something much more transparent that would actually be on the blockchain that would be decentralized and basically run by a smart contract uh, so so that's quite interesting no middleman transparent that that i mean the fact that it's transparent also means that uh, you would know who owns the song, the drummer, the singer, whatever, in which percentage. So it's really a drastic shift in, in philosophy. Um, it remains to, to, to be seen whether the, the music industry will adopt it. Uh, probably not. But the idea is to create an alternative platform where musicians can actually uh, publish their work have the digital rights managed and then uh, they wouldn't need to and then it actually might be very simple for let's say Spotify to acquire some of the, that music uh, they don't talk about Spotify but I think uh, all this Spotify is very centralized I think it's still a very nice platform in, in some aspects and if uh, some piece of music that they that, that some artists created become successful then using that platform it might be very easy for probably radio stations and people who want to distribute or or use that content to actually access to get ac uh, access rights to it and 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 musicians would be automatically paid proportionally to the revenues that are being generated from that song which is very nice very transparent it's automatic and and yeah, it also uh, reinforced the use of Ether as, a, as money. But, you know, it's really unclear whether this project will be successful, but I think it's, it's quite interesting and it's quite a change um, in the philosophy of how basically intellectual work, although it's just music, is being managed. And, that, and I could definitely see this for books and any kind of intellectual property. Yeah, it's really the, the jump between music and any other intellectual properties is really extremely small. It's just, it's very simple to do. You could almost use the exact same platform and just distribute any kind of content. And, uh, but just, you know, it's still in, in very early stages and the, the music that they are distributing now uh, is hosted on the, on the Amazon, Amazon cloud but I could definitely see that they would host it on IPFS in the future. I will talk about IPFS uh, in a little while, which is a very, very exciting project. Um, also very tightly linked to Ethereum, although it's a separate protocol for sharing files. IPFS stands for Inter Interplanetary File System is quite ambitious but when you look at the specs and, and the technology behind it you understand why uh, it's called like this I think it's a very very uh, revolutionary project so here's the website uh, you can you can have a look then um, we can talk about colony which is uh, also quite an interesting project um, that's not necessarily how they call themselves, but uh, that's how I would put it. It's kind of an online collaboration platform um, where you can create companies, build a team, and, and works on project. And 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 there is that concept of nectar. Uh, so you are in a colony, and if you work, and if you do work, if you do some kind of work that people think is valuable, you will be awarded nectar. So you could be awarded Nectar for your work in general, so actual work like designing something, creating a project, or like like typically uh, for a programmer creating a function, for a designer designing something, for a lawyer 
writing some text or something like this, some work that you can actually see and measure. Also for IDs, for decisions, and for feedback that you could give on some product. If someone says, oh, I'm trying to release that product, what do you think about this? Or I have this issue, what do you think about this? You could also get awarded Nectar for that. So it's a very decentralized and collaborative way to work. And um, also skills and competence uh, would be re rewarded in a very direct way and, and transparent way while you could argue that in most enterprise and companies, in, like in the enterprise business and in companies in general, um, it's probably not quite the case uh, where you don't necessarily get rewarded proportionally to the amount of value that you create, but more uh, proportionally to the amount of value that you can capture. But which, I mean, is normal, uh, but Colony could could actually make that much, much better. So it's quite interesting and um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, I don't know about some crowd, crowd sale. Um, I couldn't really, uh, I didn't have time to reach the owner. Uh, so oh, we'll see what they do, but it's still early stages, but you can already go on the website and, and and, and try to get an invitation. Maybe by the time you watch this video, you can already use it. So let us talk about Oracles, the provably honest Oracle. So what is the an Oracle? Well, I mean, you figured it has to do, it has something to do with knowledge, obviously. Uh, but what kind of knowledge? Um, well, you probably know that in on the on the blockchain you don't you, you don't have any information outside of the blockchain the ethereum virtual machine or when basically an ethereum computer when it's executing a smart contract it only has information from the blockchain but maybe you would want to know the price of gold or US dollars or the, 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 the currency rate of US dollars for euros or you might want to know what the weather is or you might you know, there are many things that you might want to know but the thing is how can you trust anyone to give you that the right information and that's where you need an oracle and uh, that's actually quite a, a an important piece into making contracts interact with the real world and um, and making the Ethereum platform a truly global and universal computer in some sense. Of course, it relies on, on trust uh, and, and it's unclear how the business model will be. I don't quite know. I, I assume it will rely on fees to some extent. Um, what, what I know is that Augur could also be providing some Oracle services. Since they have that reputation token, uh, people who have reputation, they could also uh, report on, um, not on, on events that, be on yeah, they could report actually on actual information uh, on the fly, sort of. Uh, so, because in the case of Oracle's, you don't necessarily know who you have to trust and you don't necessarily really trust those people. And maybe Augur would be able to provide some kind of, of reputation system, the one they already have to, to give uh, an Oracle functionality. Still under heavy development, but it's quite interesting. Okay, so let's go over hit fin. Um, so it's for over-the-counter derivative settlements. So it's really a very financial application. Um, uh, it, it's about, um, managing, I mean, there, there are two, two main purpose and 
and goals with that company is so is to settle derivative or the contract that is privately. Uh, so der derivatives are financial products that depend on on that are, that are basically more complex than the standards products like just stock or um, or bond or something like this. Could be something much more complex that could depend on different products on different uh, financial products. And it could be settled within two institutions or within two private entities without having to go through the public market. And they, it could be done in such a way that they wouldn't need to trust each other in order to do that exchange. And uh, that's, that's potentially uh, an absolutely huge market. Um, so... I don't know how it is going to go, and, and they are still. Uh, it's it's not it's unclear uh, where they are exactly in the development. The code the code is not open source, uh, as far as I know, and and. But but it's it's a, an absolutely huge market, uh, so they're definitely more focused on on B and B business to business, although uh, private. Entities could also do it. I mean, individuals could also do it. And there's also the idea of, of private equity share management. So typically, like I, I said before, if you have a company, uh, you might uh, want to issue stocks or share of your companies. And, um, and that's something that could be done using that platform. Also, quite an interesting application something that's actually very easy to do uh, using Ethereum. But I, I, I guess if some large company is going to use that system, it also needs to trust the brand. So that's why uh, it's, it's interesting to have something like this. But I think especially the, the derivative settlement over the counter mechanism or like, let's say, making private entities uh, be able to like helping them communicate and, and do that over the counter is, is potentially a huge market uh, I, I emailed them and they are not planning to to make a, a crowd sale but uh, I'm sure that I mean if they if it were to get big and if they needed funding I mean if, if you are uh, an investor and you're interested, you might you might want to contact them uh, personally. I don't I don't know. I, I actually haven't time to reply to their email, but they gave me some information. And um, I guess if you're really interested, you, you might want to you, you might you could could potentially uh, buy stocks of the company. But that that is only if you that's for real that's for large investors, of course. It's not like a crowd sale where anyone can do it. So that's their website, um, interesting application for sure. And another financial application is EtherX for exchange over Ethereum. So it's a decentralized exchange platform. So if you remember before I talked about the different exchanges where you could buy Ether, so Poloniex, Coinbase and Kraken, I use Kraken, that one, and, and those those exchanges are centralized. There is, in most cases, a single server, a single treasury, a single technology, a single place. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And there's a single point of failure, really. And you need to trust the exchange much more than you would need if it were decentralized, which is exactly what EtherX is trying to do. So uh, they only support uh, Ether or Ethereum sub-currencies. And typically that's what I, I was telling you about before when I told you about the Augur reputation tokens, the um, Slockit pre-sale token, where you could actually have shares of the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization for Slockit. And there could also be many more that will come for the future pre-sales or 
also potentially domain names, tokens, or anything that has some kind of value, and that could be traded on that platform. Um, and the idea is that it will be bridged with bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies, and potentially, although I'm not sure they would do it, but if there were some peg or some way to easy, easily transfer uh, fiat currency to cryptocurrencies, they, they might include it as well. But they're definitely focusing on cryptocurrencies. And BTC Relay is another project that actually might enable uh, that peg between Ethereum and, and Bitcoin. It's also quite an exciting project which uh, I'm not going to talk about in this presentation, but uh, something that is also quite interesting. And the, the platform is already, there's already a, de a demo that you can watch, uh, that you can actually try out. It's quite advanced and there's a lot of trading capabilities. I think it's a very neat interface. The fees are obviously very low because the, well, actually there are, there, there, is no, there are no fees except for the Ethereum platform. So, so, so yeah, basically the spread is, is zero, almost zero. I mean, it's like if someone is willing to, to, to sell you some, some currency, some asset for some price, you want to, and you, you agree to buy it at that price, then that's the price you pay plus the very, very small transaction fees on the Ethereum platform, which are, I mean, ridiculously small. So that that's definitely interesting. Um, it will probably, uh, for high frequency trading, I don't know if it's going to be possible. Uh, it will, since in Ethereum as of today, blocks are generated every 17 seconds. That's probably the trading time or the trading frequency. Uh, I don't know enough about this to give any uh, guarantee, but that's that's definitely interesting. I think uh, that that's something that could really help make the Ethereum uh, ecosystem uh, more interlinked and and have the the value have value transfer over the the Ethereum platform uh, much more seamless and 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 easy and and, and fast. Because you might want to buy a reputation token if you want to use Augur. Uh, if you want to become a reporter on Augur, you want to maybe sell your Slockit uh, tokens or buy more or or whatever, you know. And that's that 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 platform would enable this. So it's quite exciting as well. And another very interesting financial application is WaveFound, uh, which is basically focused on crowdfunding and you could also do private equity just like with hit uh, hit fin although they, they they actually have quite a different target audience i would uh, i would assume wave fund is is more uh targeting it's got it's, it's, it's focused more on individ individuals while uh hit fin is focused more on, on business on businesses but uh i think that's they, they, some of what they do might overlap a little bit, but WaveFund is really focusing on crowdfunding for sure. And they already have a, 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 de a demo that works uh, and it's quite interesting. Um, of course, just like with other applica financial applications, the fees are extremely low. It's a secure, secure escrow and just like with Slockit and anything else, you can really do that in a very simple and automated way using the Ethereum platform. Um, so I didn't give the website, uh, it might be wavefund.io, but I'll, you, I mean, you will be able to find it. Uh, all right. So there are quite a few other projects that uh, I couldn't go into more details uh, because, I mean, there are just so many of them, but I, I give you some of the very interesting projects and now I'll give you some other more very interesting projects. And in the future, um, if that's what you want and if you tell me that's something that you think is, is brings value to you, 
um, or you have some specific project that you want me to talk about, then uh, tell me in the comment section on YouTube or on, on the article uh, comments on my, on my website and uh, I'll see if I can make a more detailed analysis um, of, of that specific project or those specific projects. So Free My Funk is um, it's quite a, f a fun project uh, which focuses on actually gamers, people who play video games. And the idea is that in video games, there are a lot of items, typically, typically I don't know, swords, uh, swords and I don't know, maybe magic stuff or um, yeah, different kind of items or even maybe avatars or many things that in a sense there is, uh, or even characters, maybe like in World of Warcraft, yeah, there is, there is a market for, for characters and accounts uh, for in World of Warcraft, although it's something that I believe uh, Blizzard doesn't support. Uh, there is a huge market for this. And the idea with Free My Vunk is that you would have some kind of token that with which you could actually buy items uh, from one video game and you could use Vunks, well, basically that token to and, 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 and to, to buy something else from some other video game or you could transfer all the experience or reputation or or all the items that you created or you put so much time and energy into making in some virtual world in some video game and transfer it in some other and of course that token would acquire value because people are actually willing to pay actual fiat and, and actual money for for buying accounts and items so the idea would, would be to make that the harmonized uh, token for video games and uh, that's quite an interesting project they are they are launching very soon so you might they are might already be launching um so yeah if you want to check that out you can it's it's quite interesting uh, a very very interesting project uh is maker dao uh it's quite a, it's quite complex uh it's it's very it's the idea of creating an infrastructure that would support a stable coin. That stable coin would be called uh, DAI. Uh, D A I. The DAI coin, or the DAI currency. And um, it relies on the idea of, it's actually quite similar to a central bank in the sense that uh, the stable coin, the, the or that stable currency the die would be uh, backed by by real assets or at least assets that have some kind of value and um, and there would be some kind of trading platform mechanisms where people would be incentivized to make the currency more stable and through doing this they would earn some kind of revenues uh, and it's it's really really exciting and if they were to succeed that that would uh, that would be tremendously interesting uh, for ethereum as a platform and also for the different applications around it because you wouldn't need to worry about volatility anymore and i mean it hasn't been achieved so far in the cryptocurrency space uh, you could argue that, that central banks, at least the major one, achieve stability and, and little volatility with quite some success. Although, although we can argue argue about this, but still, I mean, objectively, uh, if you compare it to bitcoins like US dollars or euro, much more stable. And um, and so if, if Maker DAO worked, that would be really amazing. So it's also a very exciting project. Uh, there is Boardroom, uh, which I don't know much about. 
but it's 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 also uh, it's also the idea to to uh, yeah it's, it's also in the idea of, of managing it's basically a managing platform but I won't go too much into detail I'm not quite familiar with it and then there is provenance uh, which is for tracing goods uh, that are being produced Typically, uh, if you think about a smartphone, uh, there are many locations where it's being produced and the raw materials that go into making it um, come from many different places and uh, they might not be tracked in most cases and there might be a lot of abuses and some companies might not respect human rights or different regulations because it's not traced and the idea with provenance would be that uh, companies would be able to be more transparent in the way they produce goods and, and, and track some of what they do hopefully without giving uh, critical information about their business logic and giving competitors uh, an edge so and they could have that provenance let's say um Certificate, provenance certificates that they are trustful and that they respect human rights or whatever. So that's also quite an interesting project. Uh, DRIO um, is a project for broadcasting. Uh, typically, yes, yeah, it's, it's for bro broadcasting. Typically, television and 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 basically medias uh, like audiovisual medias uh, using uh, using the blockchain in some sense of course the, the the actual transfers the actual files won't be transferred over the blockchain it will just be one of the way to manage the system I don't know I don't know uh, I know only very little about that platform but I thought it was interesting, so I want to mention it. And if anything exciting happens uh, regarding this, then I'll probably keep you up to date. Then there is a poker room or poker <laughs> <Porkery> room, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, um, which I mean is basically a poker platform. Um, the, the problem with poker and, and gambling in general is that the the cards that you're being dealt with uh, might be rigged. I mean, so how can you be sure? Well, with Ethereum and the blockchain, you can be sure because everything is transparent. If the if the random the randomness generation algorithm is known, and if the source of randomness you agree is random and is kind of public I mean at least after the facts then you know that the card the cards or that you're being dealt with or that the result of the of the gambling are actually correct and fair so so that's one one project doing this and there's also ether poker also from consensus which is a very exciting company they're doing many, many other things, and some of the projects that they do, I didn't mention, but I might in the future. And then there is IPFS, which is one of the most exciting projects, really, that I've ever seen. It's it's truly amazing. The technology behind it is amazing. Um, and so, as I told you before, it's the interplanetary file system. Uh, it's something that could be very well integrated into Ethereum for large files. The idea is that you run uh, an IPFS node, so which is completely separate from Ethereum. So let's forget about Ethereum for a second. Just let's just think about IPFS. You have an IPFS node, which is basically able to store files and connects with other nodes in the in the IPFS network. And if you want someone to actually 
if 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 what the content of what you that you share is valuable to other people they will download it and store it and make it available to other people and if you want to incentivize people to store your content you can just pay them a fee just like you would in any data provider or data center using what a coin probably issued over over ethereum which is where the integration comes like if the integration comes in two ways in that many ethereum applications might need to use ethereum many ethereum applications might need to use ipfs to store the large files that that they use because they, they cannot store it in a blockchain and in the other way ipfs might need ethereum to create and manage that file token which will basically be the currency for paying for storage and that's also the way that ipfs could be founded so uh, that's very exciting stuff as well and almost every time you hear about some ethereum project you also hear about ipfs because storing files is so critical and, and, and it's quite revolutionary the way it's done and it's also something about uh, kind of a name system over ipfs which I won't go over, uh, but I won't go into that, but it's, it's, it's truly interesting. So uh, a very, very cool um, link is that one. I really suggest you have a look, dapps.ethercasts.com. It's called State of the Dapps, and many, many Ethereum-based projects are, are listed on that list. and. And you see whether it's just a proof of concept, if there is a demo, if it's launching, and, and if it's abundant, uh, if what what in read the stage of the project, who is actually making it, the website, how to collaborate, how to contribute, and it's it's amazing. And you see how many projects are being built on top of Ethereum. And of course, the standard link Ethereum.org, the Ethereum Foundation. So, yeah, check it out. So uh, it's been quite a long video, uh, and uh, so I think it's time to conclude. So we really talked about the opportunities and threats in the Ethereum space. So by the Ethereum space, I really meant the on one side the 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 ether the currency on on the other side ether the platform as well as the ecosystem around it, which is all of those projects and, and startups that are flourishing um, in, in, that, in that space. And so, so we talked about the different issues uh, that could be potentially threatening. Uh, we also talked about all those opportunities uh, that, that, that might, that you, that might be interesting to you. And, and in the sense, in the background, the question was like, was also, is it worth it to have or to buy ether? And um, it's definitely useful uh, in, to use dApps, although you, you, might, you might only need very little if you just want to run a few smart contracts uh, that, don't, that you don't have to pay for, you just have to pay transaction fees something like uh, a tenth of a, of a cent of a dollar uh, as of today to run a, a smart contract or a bit more sometimes but i mean maybe yeah five five fifth of a, of a cent of a dollar to run a, a smart contract so you won't need to to be a, an ether millionaire to to do anything useful on the platform and you don't even need to own to to hold any of it uh, if you use the test net which is, which of course is, is just for testing purposes. If you want to test your own contract and do your own project, you don't need to actually have some because you can mine it on the platform. But of course, that token doesn't have any value. And if you want to buy the actual token on the mainnet, on the actual uh, platform, on the actual Ethereum platform, uh, then you might need to have some of it uh, for using dApps. Um, 
but the most the more in the more interesting application is of course to become a proof of stake validators one uh, validator once uh, the platform switches to proof of stake the question are then well will you have a good enough internet connection can you have a device that will be powered on 24 7 uh, do you have enough ether so that it's actually uh, profitable to run it um, all of those questions are relevant and uh, it's really up to you to, to decide where it makes sense and uh, I think just from the presentation I, I don't think it's it's enough for you to be familiar with, with this you will need to um, probably watch other videos and, and read a little bit about Ethereum on Reddit and, and read different articles and then familiarize yourself with the community as well to to make a decision whether you think it's it's something that you want to do. Also there's the question of crowd sales um, where it might be useful to own Ether. Um, typically in the case of Slockit, uh, in some way or another you will need to buy Ether. Because even if you use Bitcoins or any other cryptocurrency, um, it will be converted to Ether for the crowd sale, I assume. So, um, and I'm pretty positive about that. So, in some sense, if you wanna buy, uh, if you wanna buy some Slockit tokens for the DAO, for the Distributed Autonomous Organization, to earn voting rights and 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 potentially vote so that uh, you can earn. A share of, of what of what the of, of the of the revenues of Slockit, which I assume uh, if the crowd sale is successful, people will vote for. I definitely would. Um, then it might be interesting to hold Ether as well. And of course, you can also just use it for speculation. Um, on one side, uh, for just speculating on the on money. Uh, BTC, ETH, or also fiat currency uh, from to to ETH to Ether to Ether to fiat currencies, or on prediction markets as well, where you can where you need to have some Ether on Augur and on uh, Group Gnosis to be able to make a bet. And as I told you, I I made a bet on Group Gnosis, uh, group Gnosis uh, about the Federal Reserve interest rate, and I earned. Six ether, I believe. So I was quite happy about that. But of course, something that you can only do as of today using ether. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you need to have a lot of them. If you just want to do this, then just a few of them would be enough. Um, then there's also the question of diversification. Uh, what kind of assets do you own? Uh, do you own? Yeah, do you own? Uh, a house? Do you own? Do you own stocks, bonds, uh, an index, currency in your bank account? Um, what what kind of assets do you have? And do you think that it might be an interesting way to diversify your portfolio, knowing that it's a very risky investment if you only use it uh, as 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 a currency? Um, because it's gonna be very volatile for sure. Although I would I would rather bet uh, in ether being more valuable in one year. You never know uh, because many things can happen. So it's used for this diversification. It is also to prevent against systemic risk in in the global financial system. So, but that doesn't mean that you, you need to put a lot of it. It's just I mean, personally, I would I would never put more I would never put more money into cryptocurrencies than I could afford to lose. I think that's that's a, an important principle. Um, so the idea about diversification is just that it's an asset that that is uncorrelated to the rest of your assets, very likely. So that's why it's interesting as an asset. But really, the main uses for me, the the thing that really stick are to potentially become a proof of stake validators and also to uh, buy uh, crowd sale tokens, which 
should be able to uh, give you a revenue in the future. So, well, should you invest in the Ethereum space or in the blockchain space? Then there are also many other interesting uh, startups in the Bitcoin space or in the blockchain space. There are also many other um, companies. Agar Reputation, Slocky Tokens, IPFS Tokens, and many others. Um, I give you. I try to give you the facts. I try to to be objective. Uh, although for although for some applications I'm quite objective. I'm quite uh, excited, and, and for others, I for order I am. Um, I might be a little bit biased, but I think I, I I give you a pretty fair overview. At least I tried. And another aspect is also really uh, to learn as much as you can about the platform, about the technology, how it works, trying to think differently so that you can understand the paradigm, uh, the, the paradigm shift that Ethereum as a platform and all its application can bring about and maybe build your own applications, maybe create your own smart contracts and, and, and maybe use those products in some way that actually improve the quality of your life. And I think that's quite a an exciting prospect if you think that you can on one side speculate on, on a currency, you can speculate on, on, on a prediction market, you can also use it as an investment, you can also, so kind of capital risk, venture capital, you can also buy um, crowd sale tokens uh, in different companies, so you basically buy shares, so you diversify, uh, and, and also you, you you can also be part of something that uh, I'm quite sure will will change the world in, in many aspects. But it doesn't have to be through buying Ether or through putting money into this at all. It could just be uh, educating yourself, sharing what you know with others, telling, telling people about it, programming your own smart contracts, creating some proof of, uh, con proof of concept of some idea that you have. Uh, so it could be many things. So uh, that's it. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, this video was quite long. Uh, I'll put some markers so that you can actually navigate through it. So of course you don't have to watch everything. Uh, and I thank you for watching. So please give feedback. If you have any comments, suggestions for improvement, or some contribution, like some people actually give some nice comments uh, that, that I really liked. And so, so thank you for that. So just in the description box, in the comment box below uh, in YouTube. And if you're on my website, then you can also comment below. And if you want to have more, you can just subscribe and you can find the article and the slides on my website at www.simonsayjanin.ch So once more, thanks and see you soon.